morning, here I come. Hello, sports fans, sports collectors, and all hobbyists. Welcome to the Car King Sports and Variety Show. I'm your host, the Catman, Brian Catequit, a.k.a. the Car King. We are live on ABC's KMET 1490AM.com. Your number one spot right here for news and talk on the West Coast. I thank everyone for tuning in this morning. On the program this morning, I welcome a hard-throwing right-handed pitcher who played for the Mets in 1967. We welcome in Bill Dennehy. Bill, Brian C., thanks so much for your time this morning. Uh, my pleasure, Brian. Bill, uh, let, I want to go back to your high school years. Uh, you began pitching as a sophomore in high school, and it was a Red Sox scout by the name of Bots Nicola, who also played for the Yankees, I believe, in 1929, who gave you some good advice. Uh, tell us a little bit about Bots and what he meant to your professional career. Well, um, I actually uh, was first contacted by Bots and uh, one of the um, – uh, Red Sox scouts by the name of Broadway Charlie Wagner. They called the house. It was the um, winter uh, after my uh, sophomore season, and um, they asked us, you know, whether or not my my mom, dad, and myself would like to go to dinner with them. And at that time, you know, we developed a relationship, and um, they told me they were very interested in me uh, signing with the Red Sox. Um, that um, following. Spring, um, I ended up not pitching well. In fact, I got thrown off the team by the uh, coach because I hit a batter in the head and I didn't show a lot of compassion um, because I was so frustrated because I, I was really wild. I was re really one of those guys we talk about the high hard one. God, I used to throw it off the backstop, you know, in my hometown, and uh, like a trampoline, would come back to the catcher. So a minute on third base, never scored. But I went to a tryout camp with the Red Sox, and um, I was pitching that night, and um, Botts was running the pitching. And the first thing he said was, you know, anyone who is um, pitching tonight, raise their hands because you can't, you know, actually uh, work out with us and everything. Of course, I raised my hand. And, um, you know, we were talking, and I said, you know, I, I hate coming all the way over here for this tryout and not getting any advice or anything. And he said, you only need to do one thing, that is throw across your body. You're too overhand, you're too straight up and everything. He said, you do that one thing, everything will fall in place. It seemed like um, too simple of an instruction and everything, but, you know, I followed his instructions, and uh, that night I ended up um, pitching – I walked the first two batters that I faced that night, but the one thing I noticed is that instead of throwing balls that were letter to head high most of the time, I was throwing pitches around the knees. So even though I walked the first two batters, I decided I was going to stick with it. And I retired the last 21 batters in a row and pitched a no-hitter. Wow. And um, the next day when um, I went back to the tryout camp, you know, he congratulated me and everything, and he said, did you pitch the way I told you? And I said, yes. And he said, the whole game? And I said, yes. And he said, well, that's all you need to do. The following week, I pitched a game and um, got to the seventh inning. Of course, these are seven-inning games, you know, American Legion games. And um, I had two strikes on the, uh, the hitter in the top of the seventh inning, two outs two strikes on him, and all of a sudden the assistant coach, who was my high school coach, comes running out, calls timeout and stuff, and, you know, he says, uh, hey, listen, he says, um, you got to throw a good curveball right now. You know, no one's seen you throw a really good hard curveball. And I said, coach, I'm one strike from pitching a perfect game. And his comment was, so what? You need to throw a curveball at this time. So I threw a curveball, and um, <laughs> how about this for a um, chronomium? The batter was Billy Dennehy. There was a uh, Billy Dennehy myself and a Billy Dennehy from East Hampton, Connecticut. He spelled his with two N's, and I hit him in the foot with a pitch. He went to first base. I got the next guy out, so I pitched two consecutive no-hitters, but I it was one strike away from you know, pitching a, uh, a perfect game. And that should be a lesson for anyone that's out there listening. When you're that close, you know, to pitching 
a coach, keep your butt on the bench. Don't go out there and break up somebody's rhythm. But Box was re, uh, responsible for that tip about throwing across the body, and uh, that really got me to a point where I got uh, success throwing strikes right away. <laughs> wow. So, now, now, Bill, you signed with the Mets out of high school for $20,000. Uh, tell us you know, how that feeling was like when you knew that the Met organization was going to sign you. Well, uh, first of all, Brian, we're going to get some numbers straight here. Um, we won the, you know, in my senior year, we won the state championship, Class B championship in baseball. And um, I didn't sign after high school. I okay. signed after the American Legion season, uh, which was that summer. I signed in August of 64. And uh, the bonus was $22,500, not $20,000. But the one scout that was always at all my games, so every one I pitched and everything, was a fellow by the name of Len Zanke. And he went out of his way. He got me a, a tryout at Chase Stadium with the Mets. And he kept pushing and pushing and pushing. And when all the other clubs seemed like they were interested, but they also knew that I loved basketball and was thinking of going to, to uh, college with a to play basketball, he kept pursuing it and pursuing it, and um, finally we just gave in, and um, I signed with the Mets in August of uh, of my senior year, right after the American Legion season. Now, I want to talk a little bit about the Auburn Mets. Uh, it was 1965, you hey, played Brian? a ball with the Auburn Mets, right? The Penn League uh, made your debut, and do you, do you recall anyone else that was on that team? Anyone noteworthy to mention? Yeah, very definitely. But before I do that, I want to mention one thing about, you know, my my last year in, in amateur ball. Um, I was uh, seven and two in the um, in high school. You know, one of the three starts that I had um, in the uh, in the playoffs, including a one eleven inning one hitter against the uh, number one team, uh, Lewis Mills, and then I was nine and zero oh in um, what do you call American Legion. Um, the thing that's kind of interesting and may be held for a long time is if you look at the total amount of innings I pitched in high school and also in Legion, I pitched 151 innings. Wow. Okay, if you double that amount, you would get 302. Okay, out of 302 innings, I struck out 288 batters, 14 short of... Um, striking out two batters per inning. And in the Legion um, uh, State Championships, I pitched 11 innings, which is 33 possible outs, and I struck out 27. Jeez, that's a phenomenal record. Yeah, that's one I think I could probably hold on to for for a little while. Yeah, I mean, that's uh, it's really an amazing feat. Um now, we were talking to Bill Dennehy of the 1967 uh, New York Mets. Uh, Auburn Mets, uh, Bill, 65, right? You played A-ball. Uh, yep. You made your debut. Uh, anyone else on that team noteworthy of mentioning that you recall? Well, the second baseman was Kenny Boswell. Um, you know, he came up with the Mets and was the second baseman during the 69 uh, World Championship team. Uh, Clyde McCullough was the manager. Um you know, some of the other players, a lot of people won't uh, probably remember them. We had a pitcher from, uh, two pitchers from California, Terry Crispin and Gary and Serdy. You know, a left-hander by the name of Steve uh, Dillon and a right-hander by the name of Paul Allspach. Uh We were the five starters for, um, for Auburn that year. But there wasn't any other member of that team that ended up getting to the big leagues besides the aforementioned Boswell and myself. Oh, I take it back. And also Greg Goosen, the catcher. Greg Goosen. And also, re- reading your bio, was the double-A team in which it was managed by Bill Verdon. And it was yourself and a very young Nolan Ryan. Uh, you, you guys were on the same team. And yourself, Denny, he and Ryan, uh, was known for having the strongest arms in the league that year. Is that fair to say? Well, to be honest with you, Nolan came up for the last um, two weeks of the season. He was an A-ball. He wasn't there all year long and everything. But in his first start with the uh, AA Williamsport Mets, 
Uh, he struck out 21. 21 batters in a double-A game. And unfortunately, he lost the game by, he walked a batter twice. Uh, same batter, I can't think of his name right right now. And the guy ended up stealing second, stealing third, and then scoring. So uh, Nolan got beaten the game 2-1. to one. Now, how was it? Uh, how was how was Bill Verdon? I mean, Bill Verdon definitely knew the minor leagues because in '54, Verdon led the international league in hitting with a .333 batting average. Uh, what do you remember most about Bill Verdon? A very disciplined, uh, a hard worker. Uh, he never let you uh, get to a point of thinking that um, this game was easy. Uh, but I remember in August, you know, towards the end of the uh, uh, the summer, where you know I was pitching well, and um, you know, kind of like was you know being a little lackadaisical with some of my sprints, and he came out and kind of uh, took me aside and said, "Hey, listen, the season's not over again. I expect you to get to a point of um, putting out 100 percent until the season ends." Uh, by far, out of all the managers I had in pro ball, Bill Verdon was the best manager I ever had. Yeah, I mean, he was a really good minor league ball player, reading his biography as well. Uh, we're talking to Bill Denny of the 1967 New York Mets. Uh, Bill, correct me if I'm wrong, 1967 was the big year for you. Uh, you made your major league pitching debut, right? Do you remember uh, that very first day you stepped on the mound on a major league playing field? Yeah, I do. Um, I uh, pitched in uh, in Philadelphia at Connie Mack Stadium, and um, we had a five man rotation with the um, with the Mets at that time. It was uh, Don Cardwell, Bob Shaw, Jack Fisher, Tom Seaver, and myself. And um, first batter I faced was Johnny Briggs, left handed hitting first baseman, and um, I struck him out. And at the time, I tied at Seaver. Seaver, in his first start against Pittsburgh, struck out uh, eight batters in his initial start. And I also struck out eight batters in my initial start. And that record, okay, from 1967, which was the most batters struck out by a rookie pitcher in his first game in the big leagues, um, stayed a, a Met record until... I believe uh, 2011, when uh, Matt Harvey uh, broke the record. Wow, fascinating information you're, you're telling me here. So, so you held that record with Seaver, yes. Wow. Now, uh, you and Seaver, in our collecting world, you have a relationship because uh, you and Seaver were on that iconic 1967 Topps baseball card. Uh, my question to you is, do you recall the first time you saw your rookie card? Uh, it had to be, you know, early that spring. You know, they took the pictures for Tops, you know, to put on the cards in spring training. Um, at the time, they didn't announce that they were going to put together multiple faces on a card, but they came out with a special promotion and obviously um, – it was brought into the clubhouse, um, and we were, you know, uh, giving copies of it. Um, and, you know, it was just, you know, like I said, something that was brand new the first time they had done it, I believe. And uh, I was just uh, very thrilled to, you know, have my picture on a card, period, you know. And obviously, over the years, having it there with Tom uh, makes it even uh, more special. Yeah, because of that uh, rookie card, uh, Bill, y your name and legacy will forever be cemented in the minds of sports fans and collectors, and not you know not only in this country, but there's so many collectors like in England and Canada. So uh, you know you definitely will left a legacy in our hobby because of your rookie card, along with the late Tom Seaver. Right, and it's so, funny uh, when um, when he won his 300th game. Uh, he and I, you know, when we uh, came up together, we were good friends. Our lockers were right next to each other. Um, but we were good friends, good teammates, very supportive of each other. But when he won his 300th game, 
Um, you know, at the time, you know, my claim to fame was that I was the first player ever traded for a manager. Uh, we could talk about that in a second, Gil Hodges. And um, so I wrote him a little note saying, congratulations on winning your 300th game. It's about time you did something to hold up your side of the card. <laughs> So, and it was uh, 1967 um, that uh, you were traded to the Senators, correct, for Hodges? Yes. And, you know, it's, there, there is a funny story behind that that, that most people uh, don't get. And that is that, um, you know, in fact, the other day on um, ESPN's PITI, they talked about the first player ever traded for manager. And they said Manny Sanguian for Chuck Tanner, which happened, I think, in... 72. But in any case, in 1967, you know, the Mets were uh, looking for a new manager. They had Ken West Westrom. And when they were dealing with the uh, Washington Senators, Gil Hodges was under contract, a multi year contract with the Senators. And he was signed through the 1968 season. So what they had to do was the Senators released Gill from his contract so he could sign with the Mets, and then the Mets ended up paying $100,000 and sent my contract to the Washington Senators. Most people don't realize that that's the way it had to be done back then so that Gill could receive a multi-year contract. Huh. And, and, and you played for the Senators in '68. Um, did you enjoy that? Did you, did you enjoy playing in Washington? I was hurt. You know, uh, one of the things uh, to this day uh, that really still um, is frustrating for me is that I had hurt my arm with the Mets and, um, you know, went to, uh, they sent me to Jacksonville because they thought back then, this is how, how much the medical world operated back then, but they thought the heat would help help my arm it didn't and i ended up taking a procedure down there they didn't have mris so what they used to do was they used to shoot dye into your arm and you know as they shot the dye into your arm i was on the operating table i was fully awake i was looking at the monitor and i said to the doctor what are you looking for and he said well as you can see as the dye is going in it's a straight line if it bubbles, that means you have a tear in your rotator cuff. And son of a gun, a couple of, um, you know, um, uh, maybe a quarter of an inch later, it bubbled, and he said, yeah, you definitely have a tear in your rotator cuff. Now, that um, information was never passed on to the senators, and when I um, went and saw their doctor, who was Dr. George Resta, who was also the team physician for the Washington Redskins, you know, he kind of said, oh, no big deal and stuff like that. You know, we'll just shoot you with some cortisone and everything will be fine. Well, it turned out that um, over the next, um, you know, 26 months, I got 57 shots of cortisone in my shoulder. And although we can't prove it, you know, what some medical people have – you know, kind of come up with is the fact that some of that cortisone, either through the needle or, you know, whatever, got into the artery, the main artery that works into the um, optic nerve in your eyes, and that was what caused my original blindness. Right. Now, now an unfortunate situation, you know, happened to you because you're legally blind in both eyes, and this can be attributed to the cortisone injections you were receiving during your playing career. Is that is that correct? That is correct. You know, there's no way of proving it. You can't go back that far, you know, and, um, you know, be able to determine it was this shot or that shot. Was it, you know, a, a cumulative amount of shots, you know? But, um, you know, the um, actually I had talked to a doctor who was um, uh, the doctor for Mike Zimmer of the um, the head coach of the Minnesota Vikings, and he had a similar incident and stuff like this, and it turned out that that's what they attributed it to, the cortisone that he was getting in his shoulders when he was a lineman in the NFL. Hmm. Now, now, I read that being legally blind, it's a reduction in vision to 10% of the normal vision, right? 
Well, right now I am completely blind. You know, I had a, um, uh, a cornea tear in my right eye, and, um, you know, I lost the vision, you know, in that. And um, then I had, um, you know, a series of small holes in my left eye. Right now, I probably, I can see light, but I can't read anything that's any further than probably um, 12 inches away with my uh, left eye. Man, so that means that, so really your other senses, I mean, I mean, how is something, like, how are you able to adapt to something like that? Uh, you know, I would I, I would say that your other senses become highly more developed. Well, that's a, that's a good uh, ap- uh, observation, Brian. But you know, when I uh, ended up, you know, having this trouble initially back in uh, 2005, I went and uh, tried to apply for a Social Security uh, disability. And when I took the test, you know, to to see whether I I was um, you know, legally blind in both eyes, they found out that I had a learning disability. And my learning disability is oratory. And it takes me back to my high school days. You know, if I had to read something out of a book where I could underline a magic marker and stuff like that, that I could remember it. But if somebody was doing a lecture, I mean, I very, very seldom could um, remember what you did, it. I couldn't keep up with writing the notes and stuff like that. In fact, a, uh, a good uh, friend of mine, a high school classmate, and uh, just a wonderful uh, gal by the name of Sue Maltese in one of our classes, she used to have carbon copy papers, and she would write down her notes and everything and then give me the paper so that I had something I could take back and learn that way. Man, I mean, Bill, something as tragic as, as this, something like this to happen to you i mean who do you hold responsible for this i mean what's being done well right now you know they're um they're still in the trial stages there is something that um you know they're working on with the zebra fish the zebra fish they find out you know if you if it loses an eye or loses a fin you know or its tail or something like that it grows back so they're trying to find out whether or not they can use the um the zebra fish and mix it with, you know, stem cells and apply it to a person's uh, eye, in this case, in my case, and everything, whether or not the uh, eye would regenerate. Man, I mean, we re- you know, we really have to push that Major League Baseball can put you on, on, a, on, a, on a pension plan or something. Yeah, that's the other thing that I, um, you know, feel very, very uh, frustrated about. Back in 1980, um, they ended up you know, um, making a deal with the Players Association so there wouldn't be a strike. And what they did was that they took every player that played for before 1980 and literally said there wasn't enough money to be able to give us a pension. And um, they ended up, you know, signing their deal and everything. And we were just kind of left out in the cold. You know, uh, we ended up suing uh, Major League Baseball and the Players Association and uh, one in circuit court, but uh, lost it in the appeals court. And uh, finally, in 2011, um, you know, baseball, and it was funny because it was the Players Association, Alumni Association, and Major League Baseball all got together, and they came up with a, you know, what they call a charitable um a payment a yearly charitable payment to take care of us and everything but that charitable payment in my case uh is a total of three thousand seven hundred and fifty dollars hmm. unbelievable uh yeah that's not about- monthly that's one time a year three thousand seven hundred and fifty dollars and that's not even for a lifetime they have to renew it every year so we don't even know whether that will be in place next year it's it's really unfortunate, but um, but I mean you sound great. Um, I have a couple of minutes left, Bill. Um, if we can go back a little bit to after your pro baseball career, you became a coach, right? You coached uh, MVP Jeff Bagwell at the University of Hartford. I also coached uh, before I got the Hartford job. I coached for the Boston Red Sox, 
in their double A um, uh, teams, both um, in Bristol and in um, uh, New Britain, Connecticut. Um, I had the pitcher of the year all three years. Um, two of the notable ones, um, Ryan Denman was the first one. He got a you know a small shot in the big leagues. But the second one was um, Oil Can Boyd. And the third one, when we won the Easter League Championship, was uh, Roger Clemens. Wow, wow. So, so I, I had the opportunity that. to uh, coach those guys. And then when I took the job at Hartford, you know, um, you know, we had uh, seen um, uh, Jeff. He was uh, going to high school in our hometown of Middletown, Connecticut. Um, the number one player at that time in, the, in high school was um, – a, a catcher by the name of Rick Murray, but obviously we follow Bagwell and uh, recruited him. He had 385 his first year or his last year in high school, and then when he came to us, uh, his first year in uh, Division One baseball, he had 402. Wow! And I have uh, one minute left. I want to get this question in. 1971, Bill, you played for the uh, Tigers, right? Billy Martin was the manager. Kaline Lolich was on that team. Uh, did you get along with Billy Martin, Al Kaline? Um, got along with Kaline fabulously. I was Mickey Lolich's roommate. Um, got along with Billy as best you can. You know, he wasn't the easiest guy to get along with. Um, you know, my frustration there was I had never pitched relief before in my life. And uh, outside of one start, all my um, appearances with the Tigers were in relief. Well, so, so, you know, I really appreciate your time, uh, 30 seconds left. Uh, any current projects that you're working on or in the foreseeable future? Well, right now the only thing that um, I'm trying to do is, um, uh, through my daughter's help, uh, Heather, you know, she's um, been invaluable to, um, you know, paying all my um, business accounts, you know, and rent and so forth, and, um uh, we're trying to get an echo machine in my house working and everything. So that's pretty much what I'm trying to do now. And I also have, um, and it isn't on a regular uh, basis, but along with one of my former high school teammates, uh, Don Lombardo, the Grog, we do uh, up kind of a basic uh, couple of times a week on my um, uh, website, not my website, but my Facebook um, page uh, where we talk you know, different uh, stuff about baseball, primarily with the Yankees, the Red Sox, and the Mets. Bill Dennehy, uh, thank you so much for your time, and, you know, you stay safe, okay? Thank you very much, Brian. Same to you. Take care of yourself. Uh, 1967 New York Mets pitcher Bill Dennehy. Until next week, happy collecting to all.